Hey guys, um, I go by Sauce. I'm the protocol engineer at the Uniswap Foundation. And today's talk, I was just going to do a simple just intro to Uniswap v4. Um, I describe it as this rabbit hole because you'll see, see shortly about about like all the intricacies of uh, v4 and like what's possible on Uniswap v4. Um, so in case you don't know, this is me on Twitter. Um, I'm also known to be like the troll on GitHub as well. Um, and so those are some of the funny moments on Uniswap v4. Um, so quickly on like what Uniswap v4 is and like all the features of Uniswap v4 we have. First is like the singleton design. So what that means is every or every pool is managed by a single contract. This is different than v2 and v3, where every pool or every trading pair existed as, as its own uh, smart contract, and so. If you wanted to trade across multiple pools, you're transferring tokens between every single pool. Um, and with this sort of singleton design, you get what's called like flash accounting. I think Euler calls it deferred balance accounting, where essentially you can string together a bunch of uh, complex operations like swap and add liquidity, swap across multiple pools, swap where you create like two or three different like token outputs, right? Like one token input but like three different token outputs. And at the very end, you only have to do token transfers for the input and output tokens. And so that's kind of what flash accounting is. Um, there's something called ERC-6909, where essentially, instead of trading with ERC-20s, you could wrap them as 6909s, which are a little bit more gas efficient uh, for like high frequency traders or like MEV bots. Um, there's support for native ETH as well. Uh, so in V2 and V3, you had to wrap your Ether, um, but in V4, you can just trade using native Ether, so that's a really nice UX benefit. Uh, one new feature on V4 is donations. Um, what donations are are ways to send tokens to the contract, which then accrue to liquidity providers. And so this is just like an entirely new feature in V2 and V3, um, which allows you to do really interesting like value distribution mechanisms. Uh, in V4, we also have no fee tiers. Um, in V2, it's at a fixed 0.3%. Uh, in Uniswap V3, there's like four or five different fixed values. In V4, it's like fully continuous. And then we also have dynamic fees, which is also very uh, programmable, where you can like adjust fees up or down. Um, the core protocol doesn't make any sort of like hard-coded decision on how the fees should be changing, and so that's kind of something for developers to look into. And then lastly, hooks, which is kind of like the bulk of where V4's flexibility comes into play, and that's where I'll be spending a lot of time. So all of these together kind of summarized V4 as being an extension of V3 uh, with way more flexibility and gas efficiencies. Um, Oh, Unichain, um, as you guys saw last week, we announced a DeFi-centric EVM equivalent L2 built on the super chain. So I figured I'd just like quickly chime in. Um, it has 250 millisecond flash blocks or like transactions confirm super quickly. Uh, we have this validator network associated with it. And then also priority fee ordering slash uh, less sandwich attacks happening on, on Unichain. Um, but back to v4 and hooks, we have. So what are hooks? Uh, hooks are arbitrary solidity in the swap lifecycle. Um, so what is the swap lifecycle? It's really the full end-to-end -end experience that you would see on Uniswap. So like creating a pool, um, adding liquidity to it, or removing liquidity swapping, and then in v4, we also have donate. And so what hooks are are you know separate contracts where you can make an external call and run just custom logic before a swap happens or after a swap happens. Um, so that's a quick little summary on hooks. This is what it kind of looks like, where you implement a contract to a certain interface standard, and then inside this function, you can really do whatever you want. As long as it's valid solidity and it runs, um, you can run any sort of logic you want before a swap happens or after a swap. 
Um, I'll probably do a little deep dive, a deeper dive soon, but just wanted to show the code here. Uh, before we get into it, though, it's kind of good to have some context on the difference between like a hook and a pool. Um, they're kind of synonymous with each other. Um, and so uh, you can think of pools as independent, unique sets of liquidity positions, right? Uh, pools have at most one hook contract. And then the hook contract implements these hook functions like before swap, after swap. And then you can mix and match, right? You're not forced to use every single hook. You're not forced to, if you use before swap, you can use after swap. It's kind of up to you. Um, so that's a little bit more context. And to really highlight this point, we, so here's the code snippet or the interface for creating a pool. Um, critically, you can see that whenever you create a pool, you define like the pool key. And that's the pool. It's a unique set of liquidity positions. And what the pool key is, is it's the trading pair associated with it, um, the fees, this parameter called tick spacing, and then lastly, you can see hooks. And so every pool has one hook contract. Um, the cool thing is one hook contract could service multiple pools, right? You can design a hook contract that services ETH USDC, ETH Tether, ETH BTC. You're not restricted that, you know, this hook is so tightly associated with this trading pair. Um, and so back to like before swap and after swap, um, things that I wanted to call out with the interface is, so in before swap, you will always know which trading pair you're operating on. Uh, you know, it's possible that your hook is specifically tailored for stable pair, so like USDC and Tether, or your hook supports like, you know, ETH and staked ETH. And so you can like discern different logic dependent on the pool. Um, in after swap, you actually get the results of the swap. So you get both how many tokens were sent in and how many tokens were going to be sent out. And so you could run logic on that where, you know, if you wanted to do like bonus rewards or collect fees on your hook proportional to the swap result, you could do that as well. Um, I also won't really go into the liquidity side, but we do have hook functions here. They're separated out based on adding and removing liquidity. This was like a security implementation. Um, but so there's the liquidity hooks. Um, now on to like hook ideas. So this is kind of where the rabbit hole really, really uh, opens up. Uh, so one thing you can do, like I said, is like dynamic fees and fee optimization. You can create like incentive structures where, you know, if you observe gas to be really low, Let's decrease the fee to like incentivize some volume. You could argue that it should be the other way around, where like if gas is really high, the, the markets are fluctuating a lot, and therefore like LPs might want to capture more fees. Um, so there's fun things you can do around fees. Um, Dan Robinson a couple months ago put out this really cool work called uh, Sandwich Resistant AMM, where for a given direction. Uh, let's say you're trading ETH into USDC. So over the course of a block, normally in V2 and V3, as people are trading ETH into USDC, the price goes up, up, and up, right? Or I guess down. Um, but with sandwich resistance, you kind of pin the price at the start of the block, and every single trade within that block uh, fills at the same price. You can do things like automated liquidity management. So after swap, you could compound somebody's fees, like auto compound their fees. You could expand their positions. You could decrease, uh, you know, concentrate their positions. There's a lot of like fun little like liquidity management things you can do inside of a hook. Uh, we could do like rebasing tokens or support for rebasing tokens. So things like the Aave tokens, uh, Lido staked ether you could support through a hook either by sort of wrapping it as wrap stake ether or you can create like this custom pool that lets you essentially manage uh, Lido staked ether. Um, so yeah, automated wrapping. And there's a feature in, in V4. It's quite advanced, but it's called custom curves and it lets you sort of eject or circumvent the V3 swap math and sort of implement your entirely own custom curve. Uh, another aspect related to custom curves, and this is kind of like a, a hot topic these days, is like application controlled execution. And the idea is like you could write logic inside your hook that controls 
actually the order of the sequencing of trades that are happening against this pool. So like, what if you introduce like a bidding mechanism and transactions are ordered based on a bid? Or you could somehow like prove the timestamp of a trade and you know order based on timestamp. And so there are some things you can do inside the hooks. Uh, as for more general V4 ideas, like you know, our bounties and our prizes aren't really just uh, hooks themselves. We have uh, liquidity mining with subscribers. Subscribers are like a new feature in V4 that lets you do liquidity mining. So in V3, if somebody was saying like, oh, I'll pay you X amount of money to provide liquidity, what you would have to do is you would have to transfer your LP position to them, and that opens up a lot of like security risk. And so subscribers essentially let you do that without having to forfeit or like sacrifice your liquidity position. Uh, one thing that I haven't seen really is liquidity position oracles. Um, so if you wanted to collateralize a liquidity position on like a lending lending protocol, you need a way to like price the value of the liquidity position. And so that's one project that you guys could work on. Um, like I said about ERC six nine zero nine, it's like this sort of token wrapper. And so if you could build like some sort of staking system for this. Uh, token standard, that'd be pretty cool as well. Uh, lastly, we also have like developer tooling, so things like maybe like back testing LP performance. Because like one of the things that we're super optimistic about at the foundation is like LP profitability, right? Um, you can design hooks that in, in, increase LP profitability, but it's always good to like back that, right? Instead of just going out on Twitter and saying like, "Oh, this hook is amazing." Um, so building tooling that can like verify and like back test a, a pool's performance, I think, is pretty sweet. Uh, testing kits, of course, are super useful. And then lastly, like indexing as well uh, is also like a really great topic within V4. Cool. Uh, as for the prizes, we have three categories. The first one is hooks. Um, some ideas, like I mentioned, are like dynamic fees, uh, custom curves for like stable pairs, RWAs, or very like nuanced and specific tokens. Like I guess the the two categories of hooks that the foundation is super excited about are like one anything related to LP profitability, and then two are like pools that are like specially tailored for certain types of asset classes. Um, and so this is like stable pairs, RWAs. You could say meme coins as well. Um, and there's an idea called like penalty hooks where, you know, with the custom accounting mechanism, you can kind of charge fees or charge penalties that if people are like misbehaving in your hook, like they're doing just in time liquidity, um, you can sort of penalize those. Uh, our second category is this like catch all categories that if you're, you know, building on Uniswap V4, but not directly building a hook, um, you could be eligible for a prize. So that's like liquidity management, developer tooling, MEV, LVR research, um, token issuance products are also really cool. And then our last category is like just deploying a DeFi app on Unichain. It doesn't have to be Uniswap specific. Any sort of DeFi app would be eligible for the last category. Um, and so I go by SaucePoint. That's me on Twitter, Telegram, and GitHub. You can find docs on docs.uniswap. And then the Uniswap Foundation has this like starter template called V4 template that lets you get started on hook development super easily. Um, and, that, and with that, I can open up the floor to questions. I know we do have a mic for the recording. So if you do have a question, feel free to go up to the mic. If you're uncomfortable with going up to the mic, you can just ask it, and I'll repeat it for the crowd. So.